Hi, I'm Max Rudin, president and publisher of Library of America, and welcome to the fall 2021 season of LOA Live. Library of America is a nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to publishing authoritative new volumes of great American writers and to keeping the multi-voiced American literary tradition a vital part of our culture. Tonight, we inaugurate this second season of LOA Live with Virginia Hamilton and the transformation of American children's literature. We're grateful to our partners for this evening's program, the Library of Congress, the Association of Literary Scholars, Critics and Writers, Bollinger Black Cultural Resources Center at Wright State University, Ohio Humanities, the Virginia Hamilton Conference on Multicultural Literature for Youth at Kent State, Toledo Lucas County Public Library, and the Yellow Springs Community Foundation. Tonight's program marks publication of Virginia Hamilton, Five Novels, volume 348 in the Library of America series, edited by Hamilton biographer, Julie Rabini. It includes uh, beautiful illustrations from the original editions, many reproduced in color for the first time. As you may have guessed from the list of partners, Hamilton grew up in Ohio, where her family's roots ran deep, roots she tapped for the African-American history and folklore that through the alchemy of her wild novelistic imagination transformed young people's literature in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. What drew Virginia Hamilton to write for a young audience? What inspired her to break through the genre's color barrier to become, in fact, one of the most honored writers in American children's literature. What is it about her books that changes their readers' lives, including at least one of our guests tonight? And what did she mean when she called her novels liberation literature? To explore these and other questions, we are incredibly fortunate to welcome two very distinguished guests. Carla Hayden, is the 14th Librarian of Congress, the first woman and the first African-American to lead our national library. A former president of the American Library Association, her connection to children's literature is deep. She began her career as children's librarian and young adult services coordinator at the Chicago Public Library. Jacqueline Woodson has published more than 30 books for children and adults, among them, Brown Girl Dreaming, a best-selling novel in verse about her childhood in South Carolina and Brooklyn, which won the National Book Award and one of her four Newbery Awards. Like Virginia Hamilton, she was born in Ohio. And like Hamilton, she has been awarded a MacArthur Fellowship and received the Hans Christian Andersen Award, the highest international recognition given to an author and illustrator of children's books. A reminder that our panelists tonight invite your questions and comments. The Q&A button is on your menu bar. Uh, please let us know where you're viewing from. And now it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Jacqueline Woodson and Carla Hayden. Thanks so much, Max. Thank you so much. And I have to say that um, when you said uh, that one of us was influenced as an individual reading Virginia Hamilton's books. I was influenced and really inspired by her as a children's librarian and a young adult librarian. And so we both come at it in different ways. And I'm just honored to be with the third, only the third, MacArthur Genius, <laughs> who received that uh, grant in children's literature. And so Jackie, could you just talk about that in, in Virginia Hamilton and how you read her? Mm -hmm. She was the first. It, it, it's so amazing, Carla, because I'm I was looking through this book again today, just stuck by the illustrations. And these were the illustrations in the um, in the edition that I read as a young person. And Steely was one of the first books I read where I saw myself in the literature. And not only 
in terms of these black and brown people on the page, but even in the narrative of the story, these kids going from the city back to the South and, and um, you know, spending time with an elder and all of the kind of mythology of that unknown place, but to have, to have read her as a child and then to have grown up and known her and then to have followed in her footsteps with the MacArthur. I remember, you know, when I got the call from um, the MacArthur Foundation that I had been awarded, it was the first time I just kind of sat down. <laughs> like, like, you know, I was knocked off my feet because it held so much stuff for me. You know, it held that history of Virginia um, and, and the way that the books become mentor texts and, and then from the mentor text, if you're lucky enough, if the universe aligns right, you get to meet the mentor who continues to mentor you in real life, which is what Virginia did for so many of us coming up and especially in that period in the 90s. And it's hard for um, you and me to think that there would be people tuning in and readers who are unfamiliar with her work. So if you could talk about what should they know, because I'm gonna bring out mm -hmm. my text book and talk about what it was like as a <laughs> young librarian studying children's literature and mm -hmm. what it was and like. And that's Leo and Diane Dillon on that. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. Book and she, uh, their book and the people, people could, could fly. So yes, I so in keeping with the mentoring thing, I just have to say I have a book that's coming out um, called The Year We Learned to Fly, which is about escaping in your mind in the way our people had to use their mind to escape their, you know, the enslavement and the chains that were put upon them. But it's about present day kids figuring that out on their own, especially in the age, of course, of a pandemic when you're so trapped. But at the back of the book, I pay homage to Virginia Hamilton and that book, The People Could Fly, because again, it was when I first heard that history. So I think what people should know about um, Virginia's genius is the fact that she was almost genreless, right? And we might call her stuff realistic fiction or historical fiction, but it's also speculative. It's also, um, she plays with magic, she plays with fables, she, um, um, you know, she plays with like even the Bible in some ways. Like there's, there's such a integrity and an intensity to her work and also a lightness that is what young people need and that way in which you dive into the narrative and you escape. Um, so she really had her finger on the pulse of the way young people think about the world. And that's still so relevant now. I mean, just revisiting this anthology and feeling like it's just as timely and you know, and timeless as it was when I was reading it as a young person. And to have uh, five of her works together so oh, you could yes. do what many of us, when when she was producing her work, she had to wait a year to, you know, for the next one. Uh, you, and some of us had to wait till the paperback. <laughs> the paperback or, and the library had to get yes. it. Librarians were waiting and it was, you know, so to have it, in a compilation where you can mm -hmm. just get entrapped by her words and her worlds and keep going mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. is something because one of the things I wanted uh, people to know is that before Virginia Hamilton, there's this question, what was children's literature like? Well, there was a 1963 article called the all white world of children's books. And there's been a follow-up, Jacqueline, you know, uh, mm -hmm. with uh, Christopher Myers and, and Walter, Walter D. Myers, Myers and all of that, that's saying it's still pretty pale. <laughs> mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. before Virginia Hamilton, uh, it, it wasn't very diverse. And seeing yourself as a children's librarians didn't have much to give kids that were trying to find themselves in books and be respected and have... Mm -hmm the fantasy and the time travel and all of these things, they didn't have it. So mm -hmm. that's what it was like when she came on the scene. And in this book, which was the textbooks, 1947, one of my mentors in children's literature who by the 1986 edition, started in 1947, mm. 
aspect on Virginia Hamilton and Zeely and all wow. of that. And wonderful she was and everything like that. So in the textbooks, she wow. was then there there was no doubt about mm -hmm. that. So when you think about it and how Zeely just struck you, what did that do for you in terms of a writer? <laughs> it's, writing? it's so wild because I you know Zeely was published in 1967. So that was um, you know, when I was, I was born in 63, so I was four years old. So it was before I was reading, long before I was reading, and it was still in my fifth grade classroom in the 70s, right? So it had already survived. And then um, for me to pick it up, I had not picked up, I'm sorry, I have a phone that I, it's, it's my landline that I never answer, and I don't know how to turn I'm just going to say that for emergencies. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to turn off the ringer, though. So. Uh, no. That's so, why you need young people. It's like. <laughs> I know, and they're all gone from the house. So, so the thing about it was picking it up in my classroom. And at first thing, that, that cover that they, I think the uh, cover at that time was the Leon Diane Dillon cover. Yeah. And they um, were quite a team in terms of illustration. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and it had a, also had that huge span to their career, um, but but it's even hard for me to think about Virginia Hamilton without thinking of Arnold Adolf, without thinking of right. Leo and Diane Dillon, without thinking of the McKissicks, without thinking of Ashley Bryan. So so all so what Zeely did for me in that classroom suddenly, you know, I had been reading "Are You There, God?" as me, Margaret, over and over again, and trying to see myself inside the flat chested. Yeah you know, the young girl. And then Couldn't here was a book. Yeah, where I had I didn't have to code switch. You know, suddenly it was speaking my ah. language and it, it and the words on the page were in my language. And I didn't even know that the other books weren't until I saw what was missing, right. you know, and, and that was the green light. That's like, wait a second. Cause I, re I don't know if you remember this, but the book every black kid was given was sounder. And I, hated that book yeah you know and and with the only yeah what was the other one yeah sounder sounder other one the other the only character in that book with the name was the dog right here is the son nobody had a name they were just depressed there was no hope it was so not a black family that i knew right because no matter we knew no matter how poor you were there has always been a way that black folks have found joy you know have made a way made out of no way out of no way <laughs> yes. And I was just like, there's something so deeply off. But in my fifth grade class, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know that it wasn't someone who looked like me telling my story. And then when I found out the author of Sound That Was White, my writer's mind was thinking, oh, I have to meet a white person and tell them my story and then they'll know how to write it and get it published. That was the message that wow. that gave me. And so when Zeely came along and I was like, wait a second, it's a woman? wait a second, she's black, like, like all of the, it, it just completely changed, literally changed the narrative for me. And I keep showing this, and that's what's so wonderful about this edition, it has some of the illustrations to really get a sense of the impact and how beautiful, and to see people of color, black people illustrated mm -hmm. beautifully. No little mm -hmm. black sambo, no, <laughs> Uh, caricatures, anything like that, he and yes. rendered beautifully. So that's what the Dillons did. That's what why it was so important to have and and Ashley Bryant, all of this, mm -hmm. to Tom Feeling, everything. All of, yeah, it, it started in that. Now you mentioned though too, the difference in your experience, Sounder, all that fine, but. Virginia Hamilton and her Ohio roots and the, the fact <laughs> and how families worked. I'm from the Midwest, the Illinois. Mm -hmm. thing. So uh -huh. to be able to see uh, things that related to you, how did that help you too? It must've been an even special, more special. It, it was, It's and it still is, you know, I'm, I'm a grown, I'm a serious grown up now. And it is still that thing of what Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop talks about yeah. the importance of mirrors and windows. like. Here was an absolute mirror saying it, it 
it legitimized me, right? It legitimized my existence. It legitimized my family makeup. It legitimized my language. And, and I think people were sometimes doubtful that one book could do that. I must have read Zealy 20 times before I got out of grade school. You know, it was the book I just kept going back to because I wanted to see that again and again. And I think it was the, it was the book that took me to Rosa Gee, you know, books like The Friends and, and um, Ruby. Um, it was the book that um, took me on to James Baldwin and, and the other writers that I would eventually read, but this was definitely the jump off for that. You saw it. You saw yourself. Yeah. And yeah. You, you have different stories that can be told. And I think that she talks about it. And there's some, the part that I went right to at the back, I must admit, <laughs> was yeah. the new chronology that has quite a bit of information that you haven't seen before. And you're just going through and everything like that. So you get a family life, her children. Uh, wow. Her, and what he did so that's really cool the editors who were instrumental uh janet shulman and people you knew some of them too but the that's aspect so of, yeah that to be able to see that but then her own interviews and when she mm -hmm. talked about and i would dare to say that you're involved in liberation literature <laughs> now what do you I think about that? what do you think you're in that brown girl dreaming. Okay, come on. <laughs> so liberation literature, you know, it's so interesting. I love, I love that it's illiterate, right? I love that, um, that I think any literature that um, tells a story that impacts a greater good is liberation liber literature, right? It's something that is showing the reader that there's a bigger better something out there. Um, and, and with that bigger, better something comes freedom. So I feel like even um, when we look at something like um, the planet of Junior Brown, mm -hmm. right, which was a story that in some ways was so deeply heartbreaking and in other ways was about true friendship. You know, here is the mirror of what a good friend, a good friend looks like. Um, you know, so I do think that what I, I think that's one thing that's interesting that we don't know as writers all that we're doing until it gets reflected by someone else. And they say, you know, I see myself or here's what I've gained from that narrative you wrote or here's what I didn't know about the myself or the world, but I do now. And, you know, I always say that as writers, we don't write to teach, we write because we're trying to learn ourselves, right? We're writing because we have all these questions about the world. And if we do it well enough, it's gonna change the world. And, and she and Virginia Hamil Hamilton definitely did that in her narratives, um, just broke ground for all of us. I mean, I think of the writers who are writing today, you know, Nick Stone, Danielle Clayton, Angie Thomas, uh, um, Evie Zapoy, like the Black women writers who are out there doing the thing. Um, none of us would be here if she hadn't broke that ground. I mean, maybe we'd be here in some sort of way, but, but if I trace a line to, through the history of my narrative, you know, it begins with her and with John Steptoe, you know, um, Stevie. Oh, boy. Um, yeah. You know, the books that really showed me myself that got me to this point of being able to show other readers themselves. But I don't know what my um, mirrors would have been like if she hadn't existed. And see, you are illustrating literally what it means to have that type of literature to put in the right child's hand at the right time, okay? <laughs> to have it available, oh, yeah. have some librarian, like I remember um, Deborah Taylor uh, library that was one of, and still is one of your biggest champions who, young oh, adult coordinator, who would say, I find, I have things, you know, cause Virginia Hamilton, she did it. And here's someone that is in the same vein mm -hmm. and is, I can give it to a kid in Baltimore right now. Exactly. Right. And that's the 
the through line. So, a re, uh, and I have it here, a reviewer recently called the novels thinking about the combination, uh, compilation, adult books for smart kids. You're an illustration of that too, because here you are, <laughs> a lot of this. <laughs> that, uh, so there are readers who are gonna be picking up this compilation and what do you think they might find in, in this? Because we're yeah. talking about it in one way, but. You mean the it. young readers who come the to young it? Readers, and I think adults too, who, who work with young people too. Uh, first, you know, I want to give Deborah Taylor kudos because as you know, Ina Pratt, that was my first big author visit of my life with <laughs> last summer with Mason. And I don't know how um, Debbie, Debbie knew me or knew the book, but, but it was again, when the road, when you look back at the road and see the beginning of it, you know, all, all the people there are so important to it. I think people coming to it. So I'm just going to read it from the very first chapter of the very oh, first boy. book of She's Dealing. There was an awful racket and swish as the books John Perry carried slipped out of his arms and scattered over the floor. Wouldn't you know he'd do it? Wouldn't you just know it? The voice of his sister Elizabeth echoed through the huge waiting room. Her mother shushed her. After all, said Mrs. Perry, it's not so terrible to drop an armload of books. It could happen to anyone. But why does it happen to us, Elizabeth cried, and why always when we're in a hurry to go somewhere? So in that very first paragraph, I mean, if I was a 10-year-old kid, my questions are, who is John? Who's Elizabeth? Where are they going? You know, why is he carrying all these books? You know, why is the mom? So, so she brings the reader in with very simple language, unintimidating language, right? So even though there are a lot of words on the page, the sentences are short and the language is very immediate. So someone who um, educators might consider a quote unquote reluctant reader, someone who like me is a slow reader, um, they still can find their way inside. It's not uh -huh. a hard entry point. And I think that's one of the many gifts she has as an author. And that's the case for every book you open, that first paragraph you're in and you're looking for a chair to curl up <laughs> and, and sit down and go on the journey with the people that she's introducing us to. And, and even that, that paragraph could have been written yesterday. Mm -hmm. You know, there, she, she never used colloquial language to my memory of it. It was always this timeless writer that, that is the reason her books are classics. So, um, and I, I don't know, are they in classrooms? I would be surprised if they weren't because- They are, they are. Okay, good, uh, good. Still taught. And of course, when you uh, receive the Newbery Medal and that's how, uh, and when you think about a dev tale of these librarians that are on these review committees, <laughs> publishers send them drafts of mm -hmm. books and they become the champions. Mm -hmm. of the book, the author, and all of that. So they're still being taught. And what is beautiful about the continuity and you producing mm -hmm. and readers, once you get them hooked, they want more, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So they want Virginia Hamilton, they want Jacqueline Woodson, they want, you know, they yeah. want to go mm -hmm. back and forth and all of that. So mm -hmm. it's creating this canon of literature for young people that is its own world in a way too, that you can swear. It's so true. So I have a question for you and I'm seeing that, um, um, I just looked at the questions and I see that um, someone else had the same question, but it's about folklore, which I don't know a lot uh, about. Um, and the question was um, <laughs> about <laughs> Virginia Hamilton and folklore but I just lost it. So maybe it's in the chat. Um, well, I just happen to have uh -huh. um, people could that was Brian African American Ellis. black folktales. So four mm -hmm. people doing folktales and Hans Christian Anderson, when I was coming up, that was the thing in the, in the, mm -hmm. in the box and things like that to scare me to death with the three dogs and all that. But <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, that was... Yeah. When this came out, this became like a gift book mm -hmm. in families. This was the one, oversized, beautiful illustration. Look at this. So you have folk tales that are 
taking the traditions, things that you you maybe have had in your own family, but tells it in a way that these are the nighttime stories, reading to kids, okay, mm -hmm. uh, this is it. It makes it easier for the, the parent or the grandparent mm -hmm. or whoever's reading the story, the bear rabbit, but yes. not stereotypical, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And so that's what it is. And, and these types of the hairy man and all of these things. So yes, <laughs> this, is, this is the Hans Christian Andersen yes. for kids of color, but not it, all it's... color. And I wish you would talk <laughs> about that a little bit too, because I have your brown girl journey and there's a young lady, her name is Erin and she's about seven now and she's Irish. And she loves this book. She loves your book, Brown Girl Dreaming. And I'm like, you, know, you want to interrogate her? Aaron, what is it? Hmm. Seven, two. So, but, so there's that, the mirror, but also mm -hmm. a window. And Virginia Hamilton was able to do that mm -hmm. very. It's so true. And um, to go, from writing something like her young adult and middle grade novels to writing folklore. Um, and so what Brian Fox Ellis of Bishop Hill, Illinois was asking was, how does her love of folklore influence her YA novels? And I think that's such an interesting question because it's in here, right? That, that almost magical realism exists so um, in, inside the narrative, when you look at a story like Zeely, is Zeely real or not? Like, how mm -hmm. did this uh, Watutsi woman get in, get to the um, to this neighborhood? Um, and and you see it again and again in her books. So I think that when I think about myself, code switching as a writing writer, going from picture books to young adult books to middle grade books, like of course some of the ink in my brain bleeds over into the other genre <laughs> and there is that spillover. And so I think just her, Virginia's love of story alone influenced the fact that what she wanted to do at the end of the day was tell a good and interesting story that people would love. And really not just young people, as you said, all people. I mean, I remember the people could fly and being so excited to get into bed with my kids to read it to them because I wanted to experience it again. And that's what's so wonderful about it too. You you have adults who are like, oh, this is pretty good. And yes, well, yes. opportunity, you know, an excuse, if you will, to get to <laughs> it and do that. And when you think about her legacy and influence today and and people that are going to be introduced to her. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think you about that and, and where it could lead or should lead? I think I'm hoping it leads to more writers in the world. I'm hoping it you know leads to more storytellers. I'm hoping that it leads to people having more empathy and understanding for people who might mm -hmm. not look or live like them. I think that there's she has so much love for her characters that it's hard for that love to not seep out into the reader, right? So by the time you close the book, you're just in, as in love with Junior Brown or MC Higgins as, as, as she was in the creation of those characters. Can you what talk do you about think? Junior Brown a little bit too in terms about, of loving a character? And MC Say it Higgins, again? Junior Brown and MC Higgins the Great. And, and loving them and and because they're kind of complicated <laughs> complicated but kids are complicated see that's the uh -huh. thing dumb it down mm -hmm. but um but my memory of mc higgins the great was again it was almost this folklore right it was he was he was trying to escape this situation that where basically his town was going to be destroyed. His family was going to be destroyed. He's trying to figure out how to free them um, and, and, and try to fi trying to figure out how to save them and save himself, right? Um, but the situation felt like realistic fiction. And again, I'm calling from my memory of reading it um, a while ago and then just quickly revisiting it here and thinking, for me, I kept thinking, 
where does she get these characters? You know, mm -hmm. where in her brain, like, and then also thinking about um, Ohio and the mill towns and the way towns um, disappeared and populations disappeared because of the economics of the towns and seeing how um, that got destroyed. And then ha her having us uh, see this from the point of view of uh, uh, a character in a book. And, and then with Junior Brown, Junior Brown's mom was in a hard way, let's put it that way. Um, and, and Junior Brown was, is this amazing musician who's also, for the, it was the first time I read about a kid who was dealing with some mental stuff. You know, and I think that kind of stuff wasn't really happening in literature in that way, um, from my memory of, I mean, we had Go Ask Alice, right? <laughs> but there is this, um, this way in which her stories, I wanted to read a, um, the beginning from the planet of Junior Brown, just um, the very first paragraph. The three of them were hidden in the dark and closed in the forgotten basement room of the school. They were out of our time. One of them had been a janitor in the school for 15 years, he was Mr. Poole. Once he had been a teacher, an unhappy secret known only by him and the two boys with them. <laughs> that, just that paragraph again, could I write that today? No, can I have a man in a basement with two boys, you know, in my opening paragraph? Maybe not. <laughs> not. Not so much. And because it was of a certain time, she does it and it makes sense. You know, and there's still a way in which she draws these characters that you feel safe as a reader, even uh -huh. though you know something is not quite right. And I, I think, again, that was one of her many gifts is how safe she made us feel, even in the, even as we were exposed to danger. And again, I feel like um, she was writing middle grade fiction, like it would be yeah. considered middle grade fiction now. Like some of it I think was considered, and Debbie Taylor would know this more. Um, yeah. um, um, she was right, now it would probably be considered middle grade. At that time, I think it was considered more young adult, right? Was it was a little adult. bit older, right. which is also an interesting trajectory in the world of children's books. So. Um, Deborah Taylor, my beloved, asked, can just, you elaborate? Yeah. <laughs> we conjured you. <laughs> um, can you elaborate on Virginia Hamilton as a speculative writer and on her mining of family stories? Do you want to talk about that, Carla? No, you go ahead because you <laughs> Deborah's the one who could actually talk about that. Um I I I don't know. I mean, this is speculative. This would be considered speculative fiction yeah. now, some of it, right? Because it really limbs, it really exists in that place between the real and the imagined. Maybe it's imagined, right? Um, and back in the day, I don't think we were called, we were calling, you know, Octavia Butler was science fiction, right? I think we weren't oh. even saying speculative oh. fiction then. Okay, I remember what it's for adults. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I remember the first time someone said it, I was like, oh, yeah. And then I had to go look it up because I was like, what's speculative fiction? And this was in the past, like, 20 years. Um, so so I think now, Debbie, you know, this would probably be considered some more than other speculative fiction because it plays with that line. Um, and in terms of the family stories, I remember she used to talk about that a lot, about mining family stories to get to even the story of Zeely. I feel like I, I feel like I remember her talking about that. And again, Debbie, you would know more than I, um, about that being inspired by her own childhood. So so I think that she definitely did a lot of mining to get to it, but I, I don't remember. I just remember just adoring her <laughs> and, yeah. and reading every single thing she wrote. But I, I wonder if they talk about it. I, I'm sure in the back of the anthology, um, well, talks Julie, Julie about talks about it. I think uh, it's very good to read what she says about her work. And there mm -hmm. are several interviews at the back where she's talking about the line with fantasy and, and letting you your imagination go and, and how it takes you there. And she mentions uh, a specific thing about M.C. Higgins the Great and going to her editor and saying, I've got this idea. It's a boy on a pole. 
and he's going to save the town. And the editor says, well, that's interesting. Or, you know, <laughs> so what's he, you know, just leading her to get her, to, and she left the office excited because it was coming to her mind. Well, he's doing this, he's doing that story and all of that. So that wow. process, and to, at that time in youth literature, there might not have been that many editors mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. were that supportive. Would you say that, Jacqueline? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. I didn't know many at all. I mean, my first editor was Wendy Lamb, who was and is phenomenal. And and I didn't realize what gifts I had in editors until I heard other people's stories and I saw um, the way that um, young people's literature was not always supported. So I can't even imagine in in Virginia's time, what it looked like, and to have an editor who really trusted her process and, and her storytelling is kind of phenomenal, because I think it's hard for people to imagine what a dearth of everything there was, right? <laughs> Even writers, the writers community, editors, people willing to get behind the books that were the stories of people of the global majority, you know, um, the fact that, um, you know, publicity book tours like that stuff wasn't happening for us you know um the the idea that we were probably not going to be more than mid-list i mean or that we were only writing books for a certain population so therefore those books were targeted to that certain population um and as a result of it and going back to how we made a way out of no way the children's book community became very tight. So Rocco from the East Side, hey, Rocco's asking, have either of us met Virginia Hamilton? And if so, what was the most memorable thing about her that you recall? Um, one thing that was true, we all knew each other, you know, and in the way that, you know, Jason and Kwame and Rita and all, and Chris and all of us know each other now, and the way that you and I and Debbie huh? and, um, you know, and all of us know each all other right. now is, we we met and and we realized that we were oasis for each other and also um community and home and and i feel like for me meeting virginia hamilton and it it was a it was deep deep respect and deep deep oh. fan um and also she was a hand on my shoulder i mean when i wrote for them from the notebooks of melon and son which was the first book that had uh, a queer character that um scholastic ever published and they were so co concerned about it she blurbed it you know and the dylans did the cover and they're like and basically it was that constant we got you we got you um right. and you know arnold adolph always pulling me aside arnold adolph um is virginia's husband was virginia's husband um they're together now um again um as our ancestors um so just the fact that these people that 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 canon of writers were so deeply um, committed to bringing on the next um, generation of writers was kind of remarkable. Um, and doing it and being able to do it without social media, right? Without, it was basically conference and letters. Virginia and I wrote letters to each other. Um, you know, Arnold and I would get on the phone. There was this way in which we stayed in community and in communication with each other. So what was the most memorable thing? I remember I, she was kind. I mean, I think that is the thing that strikes me sometimes now when I see people being unkind is this fact that well, for me, the children's book community was all, always about that kindness. It was very kind. And you, uh, those letters and papers, the letter of Congress, I was so delighted being, uh, when I really being aware that the Library of Congress has a collection of her papers and letters and drafts, and all of that, and, and mm -hmm. Mr. Pedro uh, did that. And for a librarian, you can imagine mm -hmm. <laughs> what we were just, <laughs> okay. She was uh. just it. Uh, and just to be in the audience at an American Library Association conference. I mean, when she won the Newbery Award, the first African-American, and those committees and how hard it is for librarians to get onto committees, and Deb definitely knows about that. And uh, I remember Deb screaming almost when she, <laughs> when the winner of the Newbery Award, which is like the Oscars, 
mm -hmm. or whatever, won at the same time that the winner of the Coretta Scott King Award book, and they didn't even know it. That was, I still, <laughs> have, she was the chair of the Coretta Scott King at the time. Wow. So, so she won both or, of those at the same time? Oh, for, another book did later, but that just the, oh. the, the significance in children's literature mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of a person of color to win the Newbery Award, to get mm -hmm. that just something yeah. and be in the audience. And uh, so her speech is reproduced. Oh, fabulous. Her Newbery Award speech. Wow. So and was she also the first black woman to win the National Book Award? Because uh, I know she won that for MC Higgins the Great. Right. I don't. Yeah. Yep. She was, was a first in so many ways. And this is why mm -hmm. I love this. And I've already started with the um, <laughs> with my pencil. This is my own copy. So I've been going through the chronology. Uh, but she she was one of the only ones to win all of them. Mm hmm same time wow. so she's the most meddled you know if you were thinking uh the olympics mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. She, yeah. she won almost every category and everything so her influence and the fact that she took you by the hand too mm -hmm. yeah yeah there before the grace of her go i um um judith so we Granger. have some questions right yeah, Judith Granger from, um, I'm sorry, I'll actually start with Julia Webb from New Haven, Connecticut. Why are myths and magical stories important in African American storytelling? Um, I'll let you answer that, well, Carla. So, and it's, they're, they're important in storytelling. All right. <laughs> so there's a point, and sorry, I, I just have to say this. Yes, it's important. Science fiction, mystery, all of those things in African American list things for African American kids, they want all of it too. Okay, they want mm -hmm. fun, all of it. So it's important. They don't want to just always read about, okay, founder or something like that. They want all of it. They want all yes. of it. So it's important. It's important. Mm -hmm. to to have the full range mm -hmm. of literature and genres and everything in African American literature, okay? Mm -hmm. It's literature. That's, that's the operative word. Okay, I'll stop, Jacqueline. <laughs> that, no, that that's <laughs> fabulous. And Nicholas Mira wants to know if adults should read Hamilton. Yes, and okay. adults should read Hamilton on their own, and adults should read Hamilton with their young people and have conversations because I think that's the other thing that Virginia Hamilton is so great about doing in both her folklore and um, the books that her narratives that are speculative and realistic fiction and so many things is she invites conversation. And so so that's why I think adults should read it, but they should yeah. read it. And back to the genre, when you think about Gothic horror in the House of Dyes Dreer, Okay. Mm, oh, good. I'm glad you're talking about that because someone's asking, can yeah. you talk about the House of Dice for you? Right. And so she uses she that to deal with the legacy of slavery and all of that and uses that part of a way of writing and that gothic horror. Okay. The horror mm -hmm. of slavery. And so the fact that she uses that element. Do you have any thoughts about the house too? Because that. You know, The House of Dice Dreer is one that I need to read. I think <laughs> I'm kind of a wimp. And I remember reading it the first time and, and being like, okay, I have to read this on a sunny day outside. So, and it was raining. And it's not to say that it's scary or, or, um, or violent. That, that's not who Virginia Hamilton is at all. But it was just about the the space I was in emotionally and mm -hmm. that not being the book I could read right then. And so I have never, um, I started it and didn't finish it. And that's my goal for this year before the year is in over to actually read it with my 13 year old son. So uh, I, like get back to yeah. me. And that's the, uh, I'm glad you brought up 
being able to put a book down if it's not right for you at the right time. Sometimes we put that on kids, you know, book guilt. You got, you started, you mm -hmm. got to finish it like your Brussels sprouts, you know. And how can you encourage a love of reading if it's a punishment? Or you got to, mm -hmm. you know, there are so many other books. This one's not mm -hmm. for you, right? Put it down. Let's get another one. It's so true. I just want to um, let you know that, um, oh man, it went away, but Julie Rambini, um, um, the publisher was saying that um, MC Higgins the Great won the Boston Globe Award, the National Book Award and the Newbery and the first book, to, it was the first book to receive all three and Holes is the only other book to receive this honor. So thanks it's Julie for Rubini too. for both this book and that. This is like Jeopardy, <laughs> when mm -hmm. you put in the thing. And that's that's what's so wonderful that you had someone that was acknowledged in that way, but also was so dedicated to mm -hmm. the craft and, mm -hmm. the, and making sure that, that her writing was a gift. So I see some other questions coming in. Jack, will you want to yeah. take that? Uh, yeah, Marilyn, I'm just going to reword your question a little bit because, you know, they're not really little black people, they're kids. So what did um, young people of color do for stories in the early 1800s in, say, New Hampshire? Were all the stories told by parents using their imagination? Thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, uh, so did you hear that question? Like what, because um, people... Um, kids of color didn't necessarily have books written by Black folks that told their stories. What did they do? Um, I can answer part of it. And I will too, because I'm older. Okay. okay, you go for it. <laughs> and this is what time period? 1800s. Oh, well, well, you had a lot of issues with 1800s because, of <laughs> well, no, I mean, the history of children's literature and I did, there were only certain, there was a limited amount writing for mm -hmm. children, 1800s. That's, there wasn't much. Uh, that's why Little Women and some of those books, when they came around, that was something. So you didn't, and in the 1800s, uh, and Frederick Douglass writes about this, uh, people of color were not even allowed to learn to read. Okay, there were laws. <laughs> so the whole idea of even being able to read uh, was that so there was there was very little literature for young people, anybody, mm -hmm. much less people who weren't allowed to be to read in that. So there wasn't anything. And little mm -hmm. black sambo came along and people were like, ooh, you know, but that's a whole thing. Yeah, talk about um, Jerry's book, um, Jerry Pickney's book. Um, what was it called? Sam and the Lions. Right. Was that? So that and yeah. changed that uh, story that was really a little boy in India. It wasn't even mm -hmm. about an African American boy, Little Black Sambo. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. So there, there's a lot of that. But suffice it to say that that's the impact of Virginia Hamilton. Mm -hmm. In the 1960s, when the first book, 1967, and, and Jacqueline mentioned there was a lot of things going on. There was a paucity of media of any kind for anybody of color before. And her impact and her legacy was to, to start with that canon, to, to provide all types of literature, and to pass it along and be that uh, groundbreaking person. Uh, mm -hmm. so that we never have that issue again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hey, this is a uh, good, I have two good questions coming. One from um, Rashida, one from Carol Weinstein. I'll do Carol's first. And then um, Rashida Ismaili Abu Baker. I'm so sorry if I um, annihilated your name, but it's a beautiful name. So Carol's question is, how can we influence educational systems that are reluctant all over certain parts of the US to include Virginia Hamilton where Jack, Virginia Hamilton and Jacqueline's writing in, and books. And so this is um, a lot of what's going on now with um, what's happening in Texas and this pushback against quote unquote critical race theory or books that 
are, are talking about race in any way, shape, or form because they're saying that these books are making white kids uncomfortable. And so these books are being taken off shelves. P parents are getting onto school boards and, and fighting against this. People are um, reluctant to speak out against it. I've heard of cases in Long Island, Texas, Virginia. So it's something that I think we definitely need to pay attention to, but I'm, I'm just thinking asking you, Carla, like what is some well, way to- uh, Jacqueline and, and Deb was on that, knows that my, my mom is turning 90 uh, this coming Sunday. And we're doing a little video and she's talking about things. And one interesting thing that she talks about was when she was in grammar school, and that's what she calls it, when they got to history, cause they, they didn't know anything about black history. And nobody, please, she's 90. <laughs> Uh, but when they knew that the Civil War was getting ready to be talked about, they asked the, the kids of color, and it was integrated school, didn't want to go to school because they knew that it was going to, slavery was going to come up. Mm -hmm. And that was the only time that anybody that looked like them was even mentioned. And so when you think about that, think about how those parents felt when those kids were saying, well, I mean, they're going to talk about the Civil War and, you know, slavery and yes. so oh, that was the 70s too. Yeah. yeah, just think about that, you know, the mm -hmm. impact, how that makes those kids feel mm -hmm. <laughs> and make yeah. them feel that the only mm -hmm. time people like them were discussed in the classroom was about being a slave. Just thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is so true. So Rashida is asking, um, says, just to mind you that Jaira Placida and myself did two conferences, Anansi, I remember the Anansi conference, Literature for Children right. of African Descent at NYU a few years ago, and we awarded Virginia Taylor. Um, is Virginia Taylor or Deb Taylor? Mildred Taylor. Mildred Taylor, okay. Hey. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering if you could speak to the inter interracial council on children's books Oh, and that yeah. influence on content and artistic production of this form of literature. I don't know about that. Uh, they were an early group and mm -hmm. they did quite a bit of work. Uh, and I remember their work and what they were doing. They were very uh, instrumental in being mm -hmm. apt for diversity in mm -hmm. literature for young people. This before mm. you. <laughs> oh, okay. So it was like the early we need diverse books. Yes. Yeah. And huh, that's so interesting. Um, and and Rashida also wants to know if we can speak to the activist aspect of Virginia Hamilton's work. I think we did a little uh, bit with talking about liberation literature, but if you want to speak some more, no, I think you're really into that. And think about your your mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I, I think that, I think it would be hard to be um, a writer of color and putting people on the page and it not being, I mean, as um, Dr. Hayden said, um, we're, we're coming from a people who are not allowed to learn to read and write. And, and going back to the way our kids had stories when we weren't allowed to read and write is we come from a people who have always told stories, even across the ocean, right? Even in all the parts of Africa, um, that we come from storytellers. And, and um, I think that given that, and given that we come from a people who, this country tried to silence by taking away what, what is obviously a very powerful tool, which is the tool of literacy. And, um, then, and that even with that, we went on to write and to win awards and to um, gain um, these accolades, then, then it's a political act, right? It, it can't help be that because it's an act of resistance to do the thing that someone is saying you are not allowed to do. So even though they're, the country is no longer saying that um, we, we are not allowed to read and write. I mean, not saying it that way, but we look at the school to prison pipeline and we look at the prison industrial complex. We look at what's happening to literacy and underserved schools and, and all of this stuff. And we know that there's still things in place that are, are attempting to do some insidious stuff around our literacy. So 
it is an act of activism as a person um, from the global majority to sit down and put pen to paper and tell a story, dare to tell a story. Uh, and so, so that makes it um, a political act. And any story that you put down is going to come from the blood of that act, right? And the, his, the genetic history of that. So yeah, uh, Virginia Hamilton was an activist as much as I am and Jason Reynolds and Kwame and Rita and Nick. And so, so yeah, it's, it's the truth. And as Frederick Douglass said in his chapter on being forbidden to read, he knew that it had to be important. If, it, if his mistress was, uh, her husband came in and saw her teaching him to read and said, no, don't do that because once, and he was famous quote, once you learn to read, you'll be forever free because mm -hmm. you can't learn it, okay? You uh -huh. can't learn it once you learn it. And that's uh, part of what, by putting literature in the hands of young people that's there. And so you, you think about Virginia Hamilton and we have to just be very glad. <laughs> and Nikki Giovanni is in the back. And Nikki um, Grimes, two of my favorite and Nikki's. Nikki Grimes, okay, here there is. Nikki Giovanni, yes. embrace the past, its pain and its treasures to give us hope for our future. We're all mm. so fortunate to have these wonderful and courageous novels to guide us. And that's the legacy of Virginia Hamilton. Thank so you. We, Thank we you. appreciate it so much. Well, Thank you those, so much, Pamela. Those last comments of yours, I think, are a powerful place to leave this conversation. So uh, I just wanted to, with that, just say, th and a beautiful place to leave the conversation. I just want to say thank you to you for that really amazing uh, hour. Um, you've uh, been listening to Carla Hayden and Jacqueline Woodson discuss the life, work, and legacy of Virginia Hamilton and and many other things, <laughs> uh, fascinating things. Um, five of Hamilton's novels are collected in a new volume in the Library of America series, number 348 in the series, edited by Julie Rabini. Um, I hope you will join us for forthcoming online events from Library of America. On October 28th, we explore the singular life and genius of Stephen Crane with novelist Paul Auster. Uh, his new biography of Crane, Burning Boy is out later this month. Details about this and other upcoming LOA live events can be found on our website, LOA.org. We will also find information about Library of America's Virginia Hamilton and Stephen Crane volumes and links to purchase those and other editions of Great American Writing. You'll also find recordings of tonight's and previous LOA live events. Thank you so, so much to Dr. Carla Hayden, to Jacqueline Woodson, to editor Julie Rabini for this new volume, and to all of you for joining us tonight on this uh, first event of the fall 2021 season of LOA Live. Please join us again and have a terrific evening.